Memphis. Over the years, when histories are written about Memphis, the most prevalent are the white man history written by the white man, of course, what I, I'm on. One half of Memphis have been given little respect for its contributions, the Negro, colored, African-American, black side of Memphis. And we'll go through that in just a minute. When black history generally has been covered, to me it seems as though we stop at Civil War and slavery and then pick back up again at the sanitation strike, leaving out an entire century of contributions by Memphians, by black businessmen and women, politicians, lawyers, teachers, and preachers. We have covered music and basketball <laughs> real well, haven't we? Now, this is verbatim. I wrote this out today. Uh, so today's show will feature a century of black history in Memphis, 1865, basically to 1873. I mean, 1973. Okay, and I'll miss some things in between. I apologize. We only got 45 minutes. I got five hours to talk about something hits the cutting room floor, doesn't it, Willie? Just got to go this way, and, um, but I'll do the best I can to cover things. The artifact of the day is the I'm a Man poster. Anybody seen this anywhere lately or anywhere? The one on display here is actually uh, one of six that apparently are left in the world. This one was actually picked up on the street in 1968 by a man by the name of Captain Jake Meanley, who lived in the substage of the Memphis Showboat on the docks down there. My friend Captain Jake. In 1995, I was the general manager, and uh, I was cleaning the place out. Jake pack ratted a lot of things, you know. And uh, I found this old poster behind a, a couch, and he said, oh, you can have that. I don't want it. I said, sure. And that was in 97 or 98, I guess I had it, and uh, got called to a, a, a reception at the National Civil Rights Museum because they were going to begin their second expansion across the street. I lived in the neighborhood. They had a neighborhood program, a little wine and cheese, uh, and then we're going to do a little tour. And the docents on the tour, when you got to the different stations, was either Maxine Smith or Benjamin Hooks or Samuel Billy Kyle's up there at Room 306, and I'm getting goosebumps right now getting his personal testimony one-on-one -on -one of what happened that night and uh on april 4th and then we go back downstairs and they close the door and it's more wine and cheese and a pencil <laughs> and a pledge card <laughs> you know it was a very effective thing they expanded in 2002 across the street and in 2013 another 30 million dollar expansion um but i'd offered it to them they just couldn't get back to me sometimes people don't get back to me on time and so I became the director of the Memphis Rock and Soul Museum, and the Smithsonian wanted it at that time, ironically, Steve Masler, who's here at the Pink Palace now. And so I loaned it to myself for 10 years at the Memphis Rock and Soul Museum. It is on display there. And then for the race exhibit here a couple years ago, got loaned over here, and then kidnapped over here, and then captured over here, and on display over here. Uh, in which room? Uh, right now, it's in the Connections Gallery. Con it's going to be moved to the Bicentennial. All right, Connections Gallery going to be moved to the Bicentennial Gallery for the exhibit. There it is. Um, uh, I've had it uh, insured, uh, one uh, uh, auction at Sotheby's Antiques in 1998 for $4,000. Five years later, one auction for $42,000. A little old simple poster like that, but with a million dollar meaning, if you know what I mean, probably a billion dollar meaning, uh, and it's here on display in your Pink Palace Museum. There's the actual, uh, what Justin gave me for the text plate. There I am at the Rock and Soul with it one time. And there's old Ben Branch. Ben Branch was basically the last person Dr. Martin Luther King talked to on the balcony that night. He looked down. Ben Branch was in the parking lot. He said, play that song. Play it real pretty. And that's when the shot rang out. Precious Lord, take my hand. His trumpet was in the Memphis Rock and Soul Museum. And Vivian Branch didn't like me referring people to her all the time. Don't tell people not to call me. You know. But that, and it's from the collection of Jimmy Ogle and Captain Jake Meanley. This is actually the third sign. We never got it right in my own museum. They misspelled Meanley, Meanie, and all this other stuff. All right, forget it. So thank you, Captain Jake. Uh, one of the Smithsonian affiliation, affiliations of museums in Memphis, along with the National Civil Rights Museum. Books. All right, here's some of the books. Just some of the books. Don't tell me who I left out <laughs> that I have. The Bright Side of Memphis with G.E. Hamilton. Uh, Memphis uh, and the Paradox of Place. Just look at them. Black Memphis Landmarks. Uh, Miriam DaCosta Willis. That won a book award from us a couple years ago at the Shelby County Historical Commission. Uh, meet me at e equality. Uh, let's see, notable black Memphians. There's Miriam again. Uh, I think Ron Walter was involved, involved in that one. Some other folks. Lost Revolutions by Pete Daniel. I'll talk to you about that. He wrote the story Memphis Rock and Soul Social Crossroads. That's the middle of the century, from the sharecroppers and the agribusiness and coming into Memphis and separate but equal. The choices made. It is an incredible book by Pete Daniel. Screening Room by Alan Lightman talks about his experiences with Malco and uh, how they desegregated the theaters in Memphis. Malco did that. Hell Hound on the Trail by Hampton Signs. I used to carpool him. <laughs> He's John's age, you know, uh, here in Memphis. He's done a lot of great books. At the River I Stand, A Spy in Canaan, a recent book released by Mark. And you pronounce that. Perisquia, I guess it is. 
There's lost revolutions. Bill Street Dynasty's up there. Yeah, Preston Lauderback tells you it's about the middle of the century. I went over to the Civil Rights Museum yesterday just to look at some of the books to see what, what they got. And most of them are about the Civil Rights Movement, and that kind of is a little bit outside of what I want to talk about today. But uh, you can see the books they have, children's books and adult books. This is the only book on the Main Street gift shop. you got to go down. And you can get free admission in up to the gift shop on the second floor to look at all these books of all kinds. Ten days. I can't read this. Whoops. <laughs> well, this poor little. i got to tell you the sad story about this sometime, too. Okay. <laughs> Happened yesterday. How about this book, Traveler's Green Book, International Edition 63. This is a, a reproduction, as you see, a facsimile edition of the classic Negro Motorist Guide. For vacation without aggravation. That's probably better than the staycation pledge, isn't it? Uh, they have facsimiles of that. Just think of that, how you had to get around the country. And there was a whole bunch of the commercial appeal newspapers there in plastic binders of, of the day after. Uh, of course, Mr. Withers or Dr. Withers' books, my favorites. I helped with this book here. Negro Baseball is incredible. This is his first big book he did that was the traveling exhibit. There's 19th century's notable black Memphians. Yeah, Charles uh, Crawford, Roberta Church, Ronald Walter there. Oops, uh, there's a good book. Uh, Ernestine Jenkins and Dr. Jan Ann Sherman with these books and Beverly Bond, uh, the Images of America books that are readily available at Novel and Burke and the, and the library. I got a notice in the library that I got an overdue book. I guarantee I'm going to win that one. <laughs> so here we start uh, with the Keystone of the Southern Arch is what it was called. Uh, uh, the Atacanda plan that you try to capture the shorelines, that's how a lot of troops and supply move. And the Naval Battle of Memphis, June 6, 1862, was a real mismatch between the Union and Confederate fleets. Citizens watched it from the banks of Memphis like it was an NFL football game. They weren't shooting at anybody on the land. They were just shooting at each other in the river. June 6, 1862, lasted 90 minutes, but it ended up being the largest inland naval battle in the history of the world. And the combination of those cobblestones and this lovely railroad track and that quick battle is what saved Memphis from being destroyed during the Civil War by land battles like Richmond and Atlanta and Birmingham. No land battles, not a single building burned, no infrastructure disrupted really. We housed over 7,000 wounded Union soldiers, are started by great hospital tradition. Uh, we are a town under martial law. First Tennessee Bank opened in Memphis during that time because business was so good. <laughs> you know, both sides. In fact, they said that Memphis was more valuable to the Confederacy under martial law than it was before that because all the contraband was moving in and out of here. Um, and we were a sanctuary city. We didn't have that term at the time. We were a sanctuary city. Uh, but our population basically doubled during the Civil War from the in-migration from the Delta, the free slaves, the runaway slaves, the U.S. colored troops forming here at Fort Pickering. Uh, that's an unusual story as well. So it's a part of a story we don't touch about on much when we talk about the Civil War in Memphis and our arguments with the politicians and activists right now. But it's something we need to expand upon a little bit more in our histories here, I think. So like I said, how ironic it was that Northerners were selling guns and butter to Southerners who killed Northerners, whoops, and Southerners were shipping food and cotton to Northerners who killed Southerners. Very ironic here. Uh, but then, war's over with. Now you go for a hundred year, I mean, one year, uh, Fort Pickering's getting ready to close. You got a whole bunch of uh, about 4,000 U.S. colored troops mustering up at Fort Pickering. You're going to hear that there's Fort is closing. Where do they go? What do they do? How did they know to be free? You know, you had the Irish who would come back in. Uh, during that time when the Confederates had left, so you had three different things going on during that time. There was a lot of tension. Somebody threw a rock. Somebody shot a gun. And all of a sudden, the Irish police forces, three days, wipes out. Most of, of uh, South Memphis, nine schools, churches, 45 blacks, two whites died. A lot of white teachers lost their jobs that were down here. Uh, helping in the black schools, $120,000 in damages, no telling what that is today. Schools burn, most freedmen left town. It was just it was called the race riot of 1866, and in the last few years, a more probably appropriate term of the Memphis Massacre was covered uh, in uh, Harper's Weekly. There was a lot of testimony about it. Memphis Massacre Project the last few years, I'm gonna, uh, it happened last year, or two years ago, I believe it was, uh, with the University of Memphis symposiums, uh, uncovering all this. The book by Stephen Ash from Knoxville is a really good book about all this, but it's a little more, let's, let's share all sides of our history and all sides of these uh, histories. Uh, sometimes we leave it up to what we call distortion, <laughs> and people don't tell the whole story. Even on this one, the new version is not telling the whole story. It kind of starts in the middle, as you'll see with this text. It starts at May 1, 2, and 3, mobs of white men led by law enforcement attack black people. Well, that's like starting in the middle of the fifth inning of a, of a game. And it's the only, only side of this text. It's repeated on both sides. I wish they would have started just one more line before. Don't you think, Jim? There's a little bit little preamp to that. Yes, that did happen. But it's like it's a, the complaint about the forest marker down at uh, 
B.B. King right behind Calvary Church. It just said he was a businessman, had his business near here. Well, that's true, but it was slavery. You know, you could go to that next step. Yeah, that's upset people. It just says it kind of covers over slavery. Well, this kind of covers the start in the middle of the thing, and I just wish we'd have done that a little bit better. I wasn't involved in that one, and I'm glad it's there, though, and it's glad that they're at 2nd and uh, Bishop G.E. Patterson. Schools for Freedmen was at Maine. And Bill, uh, the Tri-State Bank got torn down recently. Belts called me, corporation, said, we need to have this marker here. What do we do? I said, you just take it off nicely. Don't break it like everybody else does at Normal Depot over here and other places. So they've saved it. I'm going to repaint it. We're going to reinstall it on May 25th. I got this worked out with MLG and W right across the street because that building got torn down. And that, it's a generic title for the colored schools that were in that area, not just that one location. And we're going to get, and MLG and W has been real cooperative with us for the historical markers in history. Hunt Feeling Home, School for Freedmen there uh, on the grounds. I can't, you can't read that real well, but you know where the Hunt Feeling Home is. Here's Memphis in the 1870s, no Mud Island, no Riverside Drive. We're on the bluffs. We're sprawling out. Here's South Memphis, Fort Pickering down here. And this is the main part of Memphis. Pyramid would be right there. There you see uh, Court Square. What the Civil War couldn't do to Memphis, the Mosquito did in the 1870s. Uh, in the summer of 1878, we had 40,000 people to start the, the summer. 25,000 left immediately. They were scared. Of the 15,000 left behind, 5,000 died. We lost three-fourths of our population in one month. Of the 10,000 left behind, 9,000 were black, 1,000 were white. So 90%, 1%, 10% right there in the late 1870s. Uh, we formed our Board of Health. We were a taxing district for 14 years. We discovered our artesian well. We picked up the dead, distributed the food. We camped on the bluff. Uh, during the yellow fever, a lot of folks came to town to help. The Howard Association, uh, the nuns uh, from all over. Dr. R. H. Tate was a hero of the yellow fever epidemic. He was the first African-American professional to practice in Memphis. And he answered the call. And within three weeks, he was dead back in 1878. And this is at Elmwood Cemetery, by the way, on our, on our Elmwood tour. You see the nuns buried right here, end to end. Martyrs Park, uh, there uh, on the river. So look at our, our growth by decade. So 1870, we had 40,000. We slumped down to uh, 33,000 because of the effect of yellow fever. Boom, the end migration from the Delta, the immigration from Europe here in the 1890s, 1900s. We, we go from 40,000 or 33,000 here, 70,000 increase, annexations. Look at the jumps here uh, by 1900. Uh, crossing that 100,000 threshold. Same thing by decades here, 30,000, 30,000, 90,000. A lot of that was we annexed from the fairgrounds out to Goodland during that time and picked up by annexation as well. But strong growth during the time. Now look at the racial mix here. 1850, we're 28% black, okay? I'm just going to use black and white. Is that okay with everybody? Black and white, not colored, Negro, Caucasian, just black and white. That's what Rufus told me to do, so I, I can do that. Uh, <laughs> Sam was looking for a white boy who could sing black music. Okay, uh, you see how the growth here, 1870, after all the end migration, uh, uh, sanctuary city, let's say, during the Civil War, 44%, 1890, 1910, 44%. Then we jump up 70 years here to 47% in 1980. And then look, with my, uh, outward migration, white, uh, white migration out of the city as the desegregation occurred in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, the sprawling expressways. Uh, Memphis just stopped growing in the 1980s as a community. We're 1.2 million total, but half that population is now outside the city limits. Now uh, in 2000, 61%, so 63% black now, 30% white, 7% other, either Hispanic or Oriental, let's say. 29% uh, of that 63% right now is, is uh, poverty to level or below, and 45% of the kids in public schools nowadays are poverty level or below. Just think about that. And I think some ways right now our school system is more deseg uh, segregated now than it was in the 1960s. Think about that. Uh, between 1880 and 1920, 70% of America's cotton crop was within 200 miles of Memphis. So that helped rebuild us after the Civil War. The trains coming in, our lovely railroad here. Uh, Ida B. Wells, let's start with her. Uh, born to a slave, uh, orphaned in 78 by yellow fever, began writing for a small newspaper, wrote against inferior Negro schools and poor treatment of blacks in Memphis. Lost the job as a teacher, began writing under a code name there. After the lynchings, uh, some lynchings occurred, she urged to boycott a street way, railway that paralyzed downtown, and a white mob, mob burned her office. <laughs> she left town. Uh, fleeing to New York and later on Chicago, compiled statistical pamphlets, uh, speeches, really talked against lynchings, helped 
uh, be one of the founders of the NAACP, organized the Alpha Suffrage Club. Two pillars of her work for reform were faith-centered focus on community that affirmed women's equality and the constant struggle for resources, economic empowerment, let's say. The people's grocery situation uh, over there, it, it said, uh, Mississippi Boulevard and Walker, right across from Four Way Grill, you know where that is. Uh, this is where a grocery store where black merchants in 1892 were lynched. Uh, they were just out selling the white merchants across the street, basically, and they were lynched. She wrote about that, and that's what got her run out of town. Uh, her historical markers on Bill are right at Rufus Thomas Boulevard, uh, right here. Two sided marker by the Tennessee Historical Commission. There's six different murals in Memphis that have Ida B. Wells in them, by the way, and hopefully we'll get a statue sometime soon. I already got this place picked out for it, where she used to live, too. Bill Street Baptist Church is where her office was in the basement of the church. That's the marker that's there. It's the mother church of black churches in Memphis. Many of them spawned out of that. Uh, here's the marker in bad shape. It's going to be painted pretty soon. Uh, Robert Church Sr. Uh, uh, you know, the silver service set there the other day was off the bulletin, too, right? That the Captain Church's daddy had a sunk. He was on that boat. He got the land, started buying property, made it through the yellow fever. Uh, some people say, well, he bought, he bought Memphis out of bankruptcy. Well, he bought the first bond to get Memphis out of bankruptcy. Let's just get a little bit right about that, okay? Not the whole city out of bankruptcy, but he certainly made a big contribution. His real estate empire grew. Uh, here's some of these things that I won't talk too fast about. Opened some saloons, invested in local real estate when it was real cheap. First citizen of either race to purchase a $1,000 bond to help restore the city's charter, which was restored in 1893. Established a six-acre church park on Beale. It's to there to this day. It's actually grown a little bit. The 2,000-seat auditorium was the largest in the world for, for blacks to enjoy together, public assembly. Founded Solvent Savings Bank, the largest in Tennessee, third largest in America, black-owned. It's Memphis's first black millionaire. The daughters and family of uh, Robert Church Sr., Sarah Johnson Church, the widow, Mary Church Terrell, or Terrell, I hear that pronounced two ways, Elaine Church, uh, his funeral, 1912. And of course, Robert Church Jr. came on around. Here's Church's Billiard Hall. This building is torn down. The building next to it is 386. It's still there. It looks like it. There's another little small building there, but this building no longer exists. Um, here's Robert Church Jr., W.C. Handy, and Lieutenant George W. Lee, who was a political icon or mayor of Beale Street in the middle of the century. That's a great photo right there in front of 392 Beale Avenue, you see. That got changed. Uh, then and now, so there's a Solvent Savings Bank sign. And Jim, look at that now. That guy did a good painting job, didn't he? Looks really good, do not <laughs> Church Park Auditorium, again, the largest of its kind uh, in the world. Uh, the assemblies here, Teddy Roosevelt spoke there one time. Uh, but major assembly hall here. Uh, here's another picture here. Lincoln Park was a colored park at the time. Here's the, it was done in the 1980s when I was at the Park Commission. We outlined that big auditorium there at Church Park. There's a bust in the center of it of Robert Church, and it's a little bit closer right there, uh, the bust. Uh, him and his son, uh, a plaque at the foot of it. Uh, just some more of the uh, plaques and things there at Church Park. Uh, very interesting place, Africa in April. A lot of, a lot of festivals in there now. Uh, again, there's the whole thing. I'm not going to read all that, and neither are you <laughs> right now. Uh, it's too much in the time frame we got. But you're at Church Park along the Beale Street side. There's a Sarah Roberta Church, then Church Park, and then, uh, oh, I forget that church. I'll get to it. And then uh, Phi Beta Sigma. So Church Park, his historical marker there. Four markers right there, Sarah Roberta Church, Mary Church Terrell, and then we did this in 2010, I believe it was, with Harold Collins, Phi Beta Sigma, Abram Langston Taylor. Yeah, uh, it was a grocery store there named People's, I mean, uh, Bumpus Grocery. And the thought for having a national black fraternity actually got spawned out of a little talking session there. And so they dedicated a plaque 100 years later. And I was there, we're dedicating it at Church Park. They paraded from the Peabody. And we're kind of waiting around to start. And this guy, I look at this guy, he goes, um, oh, what's his name? John, what's the congressman from Georgia? John Lewis. <laughs> you look like John Lewis. I am John Lewis. Okay. <laughs> Dumb me. <laughs> but I got to meet John Lewis, you know, and he's still around. I think he's still in Congress, right? Yeah. But it's like, hold oh, up, that's history right there beside me. Um, they like me being dumb sometimes, you know. Uh, T.H. Hayes and Funeral Sons over there across from Booker T. Washington High School. Uh, the funeral home, this is the, one of the oldest businesses in Memphis. The funeral homes were big business. Uh, in the community, all pillars of the community. They actually own the Birmingham Black Barons, which uh, Willie Mays was a member of once upon a time. That, in fact, that picture, no, the Negro League Baseball book, Willie Mays wrote the forward in that for Ernest Withers. Uh, this building has been torn down, but the marker is still there. 
on, uh, right across from Booker T. Washington High School. Mount Nemo Baptist Church advanced in Lauderdale on the southeast corner. The northeast corner is where the Mark Medical Building used to be. The north, I mean the northwest corner, the northeast corner is where Robert Church Sr.'s home was. Those are vacant lots now. And if you ever read the column Ask Vance, that's where he gets the name Vance Lauderdale from, by the way. That's not his real name. Uh, Hooks Brothers Photography, great story here. Uh, uh, photography of 100 years ago, legendary photographers. We've had a lot of legendary photographers, and their motto was, where there's beauty, we'll take it. Where there's none, we'll make it. <laughs> so you would want to go to that place, wouldn't you? That's right there on Beale Street, uh, right near Rum Boogie. Julia B. Hooks, boy, I'm barely getting on there on a willy. Uh, first, te first to teach integrated classes in Kentucky, moved to Memphis, founded two schools known as the Angel of Beale Street, charter member of the NAACP. Her grandson was Benjamin Hooks, uh, executive director NAACP starting in 77. Benjamin Franklin Booth, uh, an attorney. This is right in front of B.B. King's. I mean, the, the, all the businesses on Beale Street, it was the main street of Negro America, they said, a mile of vice and commercial ambition owned by the Jews, policed by the whites, and enjoyed by the Negroes. And that was Lieutenant George W. Lee's statement, the mayor of Beale Street, because it was about eight or ten blocks long, past Danny Thomas, not the entertainment zone you see now. Hardware stores, clothes stores. There were 12 barber shops or 39 barbers at one time through there. Everything was happening on Beale Street because it was a segregated city. So he had law offices too. Josiah Settle, this is on Poplar by the uh, Convention Center. It was an early attorney here, black attorney. Uh, historic Orange Mound in 1890. We're already up to 1890 now. The first neighborhood in America designed exclusively for African American or black ownership in 1890. And to this day, and there's Mary Mitchell. Is she here today, Mary? Oh, y'all need to meet Mary Mitchell, uh, the official historian for, uh, for Orange Mound now. Uh, what a great treasure she is. And she's led me into a lot of these histories. But it's one of the only neighborhood in America to have seven churches, congregations over 100 years old that still have descendants from those original members attending those churches. The only neighborhood in America, Orange Mound. Uh, you, uh, you hear about Orange Mound all the time at 10 o'clock at night, don't you? But you don't hear about some of these other things that happen in the community. I mean, I'm sorry, that's where our, our TV stations are sometimes. Some bad things do happen. But you think about the lawyers and the dentists, like Dr. Pinkston uh, that we knew, the family of, or the Olympians, <laughs> you know, and some of the great teachers coming out of Orange Mound. It's amazing. Jesse Wilburn, I met him before he passed away. Uh, he was with the, uh, one of the uh, programs we did with Orange Mound. But he and my coach, Coach Peters, they integrated high school athletics in Memphis in 1975. Track and field. 1965, track and field, a non-contact sport. Think how smart they were to do that. <laughs> Football and basketball, and, uh, you'd be getting in huddles and throwing elbows. Mount Moriah Baptist Church, there's several markers in the Orange Mount area. A lot of this is marker laden. This is easy to do programs when you do the historical markers of our town. The public landmarks in Orange Mound, uh, and there's a real rebirth with the Orange Mound School, Old Melrose School, and Memphis Heritage has got involved with it. Dietrich Family Cemetery is a white family there from Nashville that owned the land, they planted orange bushes that had orange blossoms. That's where the name Orange Mound came. Uh, and then E.E. Uh, e. Meacham is the one, who's buried in Elmwood Cemetery, by the way, uh, uh, who actually divided the neighborhood up in 1890 to make it uh, for ownership. Uh, there's the Dietrich Family Cemetery. Big old tree right there. It hangs out over Park Avenue, right past Airways. Uh, we did an exhibit with Orange Mound in the County Hall in 2017, a beautiful exhibit they put together. Uh, about the history of Orange Mound. This is our, right now the Women of Achievement exhibit is in this, uh, the Vasco A. Smith Administration Building. NAACP 1909, New York City. Mary Church Terrell and Ida B. Wells, only women invited to sign the call. Benjamin Hooks was the executive secretary later on from Memphis, and Jesse Turner from Memphis was a treasurer. They served in national office from Memphis here. Uh, Memphis Branch is a newspaper story about the courage of the Memphis Branch NAACP. I just thought I'd pop that in here from February 18, 1982. Uh, and then here is the application for the charter for the Memphis Branch NAACP, one of the oldest in the country. Uh, and you see, if we did this real slow in a five-hour show, we could read some of these names. You can see, well, Robert Church Jr. right there. Uh, and uh, this is the actual uh, photocopy of that. That's uh, June 26, 1970, Fifth Avenue, New York City. Uh, the Memphis Branch NAACP, this is a part of the lynching of L. Persons marker we did two years ago out on Summer Avenue. It will be relocated down to the actual site of the bridge pier on Macon when uh, Wolf River Conservancy finishes their 13-mile walkway going from Mississippi all the way 
to Shelby Farms. But at the same time, Students United Memphis from Overton High School in their 11th grade year started, they heard about these lynchings. There's a lynching sites project Memphis office, 31 lynchings in Shelby County, about 5,000 nationwide. And they're determined to put a marker about on every one of them, aren't they, Jim? We're working with them. This is one we did, the first one we did at the same time. They were going to shy away because the Memphis Branch NAACP was going to do it. And Dr. Marilyn Taylor, I said, no, let's go ahead and do it. This is a kid's project. They're students. It's a great project for them. And we met with them at Overton School and on a rainy day. And uh, just I could tell you some other stories. Not time won't do it. But we got that one in the same day that the NAACP, we did a joint one at 2 o'clock, one at 3 o'clock. This is on Summer Avenue. You can see it from Summer Avenue. It'll always be there right near the uh, Wolf River Bridge. Then the lynching of Lee Walker in downtown last year uh, uh, over where the jail used to be there at auction and North Front, which is now Willis in North Front on the northwest corner. This is right at the trolley track level there. Robert Church, Jr., businessman, leader, political leader. Uh, there's Lieutenant George W. Lee. Uh, Lieutenant of Beale Street. Uh, very interesting stories in the middle of the century. You can go good and bad with both these guys uh, right up and down, I think, when you look at some of the things about separate but equal in the middle of the century uh, with the con uh, compliance with the Crump administration. Uh, it's really interesting in Preston Lauderbach's book, Beale Street Dynasty, covers that. So does Memphis going down and lost revolutions. And, uh, uh, but it was a tough time in the middle of Memphis in the middle of the 20th century all the way around. Uh, this marker is down across from the Hunt Phelan home uh, for Lieutenant George W. Lee. The street's named for him there right by the Memphis Rock and Soul Museum. Bishop Charles H. Mason, the founder in 1897, Church of God of Christ, largest uh, Pentecostal church in the United States today. Uh, over there, of course, it's the site of Dr. King's last speech. Uh, there's a historical marker there for him in the bushes right there on Mason Street, right south of Crump. You can see that big red roof from the roof of the Peabody Hotel. You can see Claiborne Temple, then look right out straight ahead, and you see a big red roof and the trees about a mile out. It's, you can see 10 things that changed the world from the roof of the Peabody Hotel on my tour. <laughs> March 9th, 17th, and 30th, y'all come. <laughs> Three more times. Uh, Mason Temple, here's the interior here. Uh, Church of God in Christ there. Uh, First Baptist Church, Lauderdale, uh, over there by BTW. Again, it splintered off from uh, First Baptist, I mean, Beale Street Baptist Church. Uh, University of West Tennessee, uh, established in Jackson, moved to Memphis. It finally closed in 1924, but a lot of physicians came through the University of West Tennessee. Over there on McLemore Avenue is where this historical marker is, about halfway between Mississippi Boulevard and Stacks on the south side of the road, in that location there. Vacant lot right now, University of West Tennessee. Bet you hadn't heard of that, huh? That's UWT, huh? Uh, Blair T. Hunt, educator, minister, Lemoyne Normal Institute. Look at all these achievements here. Teacher at Porter Elementary, principal at Cortrecht, LaRose, BTW, 27 years, chaplain in the, in the World War I, pastor for 50 years, many community and civic positions. First black appointee to the Shelby County School Board. Blair T. Hunt, a missing marker right now. Oops. THC knows about it, though. Dr. Charles Rulak, you probably drive by this house all the time on McLemore, uh, was a medical examiner, purchased the home at 810 McLemore. It's the Rulak Mansion bed and breakfast now. There it is. Bed and breakfast right there on McLemore. Some beautiful appointments in the fencing and the little gazebo there. First high schools, Booker T. Washington, Manassas. Uh, you can see the term colored. I'll come back to that in a minute, I think, in this program. Let's just do it right now. There's a race exhibit here a couple years ago. We were here then and had a boy in the T-shirt. And, and just standing there in a the t-shirt, and it had, uh, in 1890, he was uh, Negro. In 1920, he was colored. In 1960, he was African-American. In 1990, he's black. Same kid, just four different descriptives. So let's say over a 100-year period of time, how we try to talk in context. When we write markers and stuff, we don't use the word uh, African-American when we're talking about Reconstruction. And we don't use the word Negro when we're talking about modern day. We try to put our text in the time that that happened. Isaac Hayes went to Manassas, came from what, uh, Brownsville? You've heard of Isaac Hayes. But we're not going to talk about music today, okay? We did that the other day. Corey P. Taylor, the first uh, uh, principal there at Manassas. Uh, these two markers there at Manassas at 111 Manassas Avenue. It, 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 they moved the school from off of a Firestone. G.P. Hamilton over there at Hamilton. I believe it's junior high or middle school or elementary right now, not where the big Hamilton is. One of the great early educators in our community. He's buried at Elmwood Cemetery. We portray him sometimes. School's still there. Green P. Hamilton, just a very distinguished career here. 
uh, Bright Side of Memphis, that was one of the books you could hardly read. The title, uh, Bright Side of Memphis, is a very interesting book. That really more is an index of all the people, it seems like to me, and during that time, which is very helpful to people like us when we're trying to find names and places. Hey, Lucy Tibbs might be in there. Um, let's see. There it is right there. It's kind of hard to read right there, but uh, there's the book he wrote. Uh, it is available at Burke's Bookstore. Howe Institute, program from Howe Institute. Uh, Lemoyne Normal School, uh, like West Tennessee Normal School. Lemoyne, finally, in, uh, the last graduating class was 1968. We're doing a marker right now for them. It merged with Owen uh, in 1968-69. Lester Street School, that building was torn down not too long ago. It had been empty for a long time over in the Binghamton area. Here's Lemoyne Owen College now. That marker's up over on Walker. A lot of markers on the Walker. Owen was on Vance. It's where Vance Middle School is now. It's getting ready to be torn down, apparently. And they merged in 1968. Uh, it had opened in 52, 54 right here, and they finally uh, merged uh, with Lamont and Owen. Owen College, there's a photo of it, some of its graduates. Dr. W.W. W. Harrington's over here on Walker Street. Now, he is, besides Margaret Polk, we figured out she was born in Memphis, but he's the only Memphian that has a statue that was born in Memphis. It was Dr. Harrington. He's not quite that tall. I think I made him that tall in the, in the picture here, <laughs> moving it in. Uh, Doc, he's running for mayor again. Uh, but he was mayor from uh, 91 to about 2009. College Chapel, home and hospital. Fraternity ward operating room. Sterile. Dr. J.B. Martin was a superintendent there for a long time. College Chapel. Uh, Richard Wright, black boy. What a great story. In the library down on Front Street, uh, blacks were not allowed to go in and, and get books. Segregated library. So, but he was allowed to go pick up books for his white man he worked for uh, with the titles with the list. These are the books you can go pick up. Go pick them up for me at the library. So he finally convinced his, uh, not owner, uh, the man he worked for, uh, to write a couple of titles he wanted to read on there in his own handwriting. And so he was able to check out books for himself, you see. That's how he got around it. And the friends of the libraries uh, put a plaque up. It's still there in 1998. It was put up there. And of course, Richard Wright, that, this was kind of that whole situation was an inspiration for his book, Black Boy. Uh, there's Richard Wright. Uh, there's Black Boy right there. That's down there right on Front Street, right inside a door, right by an elevator. Tom Lee Park, we talked extensively about Tom Lee the other day in the riverfront, but he uh, was a hero of 1925 when the steamer Emmy Norman sank. Um, he he uh, saved 32 lives. The city made him a hero, gave him a home uh, on Mansfield Street. Uh, his great-great-niece was here the other day. We met her. We're trying to do a historical marker for that home and raise some money to save it. Uh, got a job of all places with the city with the sanitation department, <laughs> you know. Not good working conditions in the sanitation department. Might have wanted to still be on the river, I think, you know. Uh, swimming pool, Astor Park was renamed. That was from 1935 to 52. Tom Lee Park was Astor Park after the Astoria Fur Company, renamed uh, and expanded later on. And all those, there's the obelisk was there. It's been blown down twice. It it's no longer stands. But he was a very worthy Negro at the time. And that still stands right there. And then later on, this depiction was done in 2006 by David Allen Clark that better depicts his heroic events than an obelisk, let's say. A very moving sculpture there. Uh, I think it's very good. Uh, Urban Art Commission, RDC, and the family of the descendants of Tom Lee. I took that picture. That's pretty good, isn't it, Willie? <laughs> uh, and here's the plaque I didn't show the other day. Somebody asked about David Allen Clark. It's right there prominently. I've had to save it a couple of times down there from Memphis and May. There's his grave in Mount Carmel Cemetery. You know, this, uh, this uh, Sunday, or no, March 9th is when they're doing a, for Charles Burst, one of the Memphis Jug Band, uh, in Rose Hill Cemetery across the street at 2 o'clock, a ceremony to put up a new stone for him. There's the Mansfield House, and there's the rough side of the interior right there. Tom Lee Poole. James Hyder, Old Man River. Our city got united with Memphis and May from the Cotton Maker Jubilee to the Cotton Carnival in the 1970s. He had a... Uh, Biracial group come together and form Memphis in May. A lot of great leaders there. Uh, of course, that's grown and grown and grown to be the Memphis and May International Festival, the largest of its kind in the country. But everybody remembers old James Hyder. You take the high note and I'll take the low note. Uh, and he changed the lyrics, too, to try to be a little bit more sensitive uh, to that song lyrics right there. And by the way, I always say he's the one that I think of when I say Mississippi River is our first transgender river. Old Man River, she just keeps moving along. <laughs> I think of James Hyder every time. I got to visit him right over here in the um, living center, Wesley Towers, before he passed away. Uh, Sheila Hall and Bobby Hall and I went over and visited with him. 
Legacies in this Chickasaw Heritage Park, formerly the Soto Park. Uh, this is done by a sculptor named Vinnie Bagwell out of Chicago, Urban Art Commission sculpture. Hard to see right here, so I did this. On the outside shoulder, here's uh, Native American towns, uh, a Native American female, uh, blues musicians, conquistador. All these representations represent Native American, Hispanic American, and African American heritage in Memphis. All in that one statue. Well done at Chickasaw Heritage Park, right when you get down near the National Ornamental Metal Museum. Golly. Uh, W.C. Handy, y'all have heard of him, right? Blues, music, okay. Beale Street was a main street of, of uh, vice and commercial ambition, owned by the Jews, policed by the whites, and enjoyed by the Negroes. Uh, W.C. Handy wrote the Memphis Blues here as a, as a campaign song, published it for the first time, and other songs. Uh, lots going on on Beale Street during that time. This is an angle looking east to west. Gillis Brothers, a lot of retail on there. This historical marker's been saved. I got it back up. Uh, grocers, a pharmacist, George Jackson. This is right in front of Peoples now. There's about 12 markers on Beale Street now we've been able to save. Handy Park, the 1930s, a lot of music on the street. There's old B.B. King in his short shorts. Don't see that too often. Uh, music in the parks, music on the street corners, music in the clubs. Cotton Makers Jubilee, again, separate but equal. Royalty, very a lot of pageantry during that time. Uh, Ethel Vincent, I got to meet her later on uh, in the 80s when this was kind of winding down. I think it became Comet Jubilee, and then finally Africa in April grew out. Africa in April had its first uh, event in Confederate Park. Oh, David Acey always likes to tell me about that first couple of years there in Confederate Park. I was at the Park Commission at the time. I said, go for it, <laughs> you know. Uh, Chitlin Circuit, all the musicians went around the south and the stores, Clarksdale and Tupelo and Greenville and Paragould, whatever, performing the blues musicians on the Chitlin Circuit. Jimmy Lunsford was out of Manassas High School, uh, great orchestra leader, the Chickasaw, Chickasaw Syncopators. Let me leave him up just for a second. He went on to New York City, uh, rival Count Basie and Duke Ellington, passed at an early age, like in the 40s. He's buried at Elmwood Cemetery. We portray him at Elmwood every year in the music section. Beale Street Historic District, 1966 by the Department of Interior. Um, w. Herbert Brewster, minister, composer, dramatist, singer, poet, community leader. You ever heard of W. Herbert Brewster? We heard of Brewster School down there in Binghampton. But he, uh, on, at nighttime, uh, on Sunday nights, he had a camp meeting on the air. Elvis would go down there. Jimmy Hayslip would go there and sing. Uh, and Sam Phillips would listen to it over the WHBQ. He published more than 200 gospel songs, Move On Up a Little Higher, recorded by Mahalia Jackson. Uh, first million selling black gospel records in America. Uh, 2007 Memphis City Schools named a new school for him there uh, in Binghampton. He's got a note on Bill Street, a historical marker where he used to live over in the North Memphis neighborhood. East Trigg Baptist Church was his original pulpit over there on East Trigg, which it's now on Bellevue. <laughs> uh, Lucy Campbell. Uh, uh, teacher at BTW, music leader, composer. This is a great story here. Uh, 42 years at BTW, invited to attend uh, by FBI to attend the conference on Negro Child Welfare, one of nine founders of the Baptist Training Union, composed more than 80 hymns and anthems. Uh, he'll understand and say, well done. Okay, now White Cornbread Lawrence Welk and Pat Boone can record that song from a, a little black lady teacher at BTW. That shows you what an impact this lady was in the music she had. And she was to religious songs what W.C. Handy was to the blues, is what they said. There's an elementary school in Frazier named for Lucy Campbell. And uh, she has a historical marker right there in front of BTW. First all-black formatted radio station in the world, WDIA, 1948, uh, up about where Olden Square is now, moved around a lot. Uh, this marker is at 112 Union Avenue. That's a little bit misleading. There's a big uh, WDIA sign marquee there. There's Nat Williams. Uh, Rufus Thomas, B.B. King were early DJs there. Mark, when did you go on air? 58. 58, still on. Every Sunday afternoon, 3.30, Gospel, WDA. Mark Stansbury, 10, 1070 on your dial? Right. Thank you, sir. Home of the Blues record shop. We had great record shops. This was on Beale Street. Uh, my favorite was Boss Ugly Bob. I've said this before. <laughs> if I had a record shop, I'd name it Boss Ugly Bob. Uh, but it's on uh, mm, Trig, I think. It's over there right off Walker in that area. But you'll see right here, he saw the need for Black Music Distribution Network in the 1960s. That was a pioneer there, Robert Kerriam, uh, Boss Ugly Bob. Two Kings, Ernest Withers took this picture in 1955 in the Ellis Auditorium. That's Elvis on the right, B.B. King on the left. Y'all got that? 
who would have thought that 60 years later there'd be those statues there at the Welcome Center a block away? This tells you more about Memphis music history than anything, I think, right there. The two kings. Of course, we have an intersection of king and king. B.B. King, Dr. Martin Luther King. Nobody else can say that in the world. And we had three kings of Memphis. Elvis, the king, gave us our voice. B.B. King gave us our soul. Dr. Martin Luther King gave us our conscience. That's a quote from A.C. Ward. Next time you see A.C., tell him that Jimmy Ugle's still giving you credit for that quote. I saw him the other day at Claiborne Temple, and he just looked at me like I was crazy. Uh, and we don't mention our other king, Jerry Lawler, or King Cotton either, right? Uh, but these are our three kings of Memphis. B.B. King, of course, out of Itabina, the restaurant above B.B. King's is, is named for Itabina, the Lucille Guitar Store. We could tell all this. That all came in the music deal the other day, but uh, 15,000 concerts, all sorts of recognition, uh, uh, and a great museum down in uh, Indianola. The Blues Foundation, this is right there on South Main Street across from the National uh, Civil Rights Museum gift shop exit. Um, uh, coordinate the activities of blues societies all over the world, over 200 Great museum there, Hall of Fame. Uh, the blues, blues Music Awards will be in May this year. The International Blues Challenge in January this year gets almost 1,000 participants from five nations, 31 country, uh, 13 countries, 31 states. Little Milton Campbell sitting there on a bench waiting for you to come sit by him and take a picture like everybody does. He's actually sitting on a bench looking at the Mississippi River uh, with his Gibson guitar going by. That's what it depicts. And that's from the Rockland, Maine, the North Atlantic Blues Festival sponsored that. Uh, high recording in that same neighborhood is Soulsville and Stax. WLOK was the first black-owned radio station in Memphis, 1977. It's still down there on South 2nd Street. WLOK, black radio that most blacks listen the most of the time. Welcomes the City of Memphis magazine. Here you go. Bobby Bland statue right there on the GNW campus right across from Hotel Chiska, uh, right there at Main and King Avenue. Bobby Bland, born in uh, Barrettville, Tennessee. There's some historical markers out there. Uh, by Historic Archives of Rosemark and Environs. Here's the statue there. You can go get your picture standing with Bobby Bouvan. Act like you're singing. A lot of people do that. Uh, it's set up so you can walk up a little path to do that, by the way. Uh, there's this, the uh, historical markers out on Barrett Road. Memphis Red Sox, the baseball team in the middle of the century, the only team that the owners also own their own stadium, the black owners. All the rest were white, were renting from white stadiums in other cities. So Martin Stadium, named for the Martin Dr. Brothers, and of course the Lewis family from R.S. Lewis and Sons Funeral Home were involved. Uh, here's some of the great photos by Ernest Withers. There's the Martins right in there. Uh, look at the people out there. Just imagine getting a line drive hit at you in left field there, dodging it or whatever. Uh, historical marker. That's right there at, at Crump and Thomas, uh, where Mack Truck is now. You'll see this marker on Crump Avenue. These are all Withers pictures from his Memphis uh, Negro League Baseball. Happy guys winning ball. Jackie Robinson played down here. This said that Jackie Robinson actually signed his Major League Baseball contract in the Martin Medical Building at Vance and Lauderdale. Think about that. He was in town in the, in the minor leagues. There are the four Martin brothers. Some of them actually got run out of town later on by the Crump administration. Sad story when you get into the bottom of that. Uh, the Mar here's the, again, there's the neighborhood I was talking about at Vance and Lauderdale. That's where uh, the Mark Medical Building used to be. Across the street is where uh, Robert Church Sr. used to be. And of course, right over here is Mount Nebo Baptist Church right behind us. Uh, Public Parsons Street. Now look at this recently in the last 20 or 25 years. How many, uh, weren't necessarily white name streets or just generic name streets uh, like Riverside Park became Dr. Martin Luther King Riverside Park. And then the Riverside got taken off. It's Dr. Dr. Martin Luther King Park. But if you come in from the South Expressway, Dr. Martin Luther King Park, then you got Tom Lee Park, come up Beale Street, Handy Park, Robert Church Park, B.B. King Boulevard, Rufus Thomas Boulevard, Dr. Martin Luther King Reflection Park, Amaman Plaza, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Avenue, Bishop G. Patterson Avenue, A.W. Willis on the north side of town and the bridge, Vasco A. Smith Administration Building, Judge Odell Horton. Who's on, his name's on the same building with the guy that ran for the KKK party, by the way. Now, we haven't said nothing about that, have we? Clifford O. Davis. Uh, Judge Jeremy Bailey Courthouse, Walter Bailey Criminal Justice Complex. Uh, our, our downtown is blanketed with African-American or black history or Negro history or whatever you want to call it. Well recognized. Uh, we probably just probably suddenly don't realize all these places that are named for great leaders of the black community during this century we're talking about. The Heritage Trail came last year during the MLK 50. This is from Housing and Community Development. South Main, Beale Street, East. There's bro these brochures are right outside. Please, please pick up a brochure on the table. They got tons of them. And this tells you everything in this area. There are historical markers up. The new I'm a Man Plaza, uh, right by Claiborne Temple. Uh, uh, tribute to the 1,100 sanitation workers. 
this is a great park right here. They closed off uh, Pontotoc Street to make it happen. Uh, right by Claiborne Temple. A lot of activities in Claiborne Temple now, too. And then the reflection site on the MLG and W campus. And see, these are the markers you'll see in that whole historical uh, heritage area that helps you get around the whole area, tells you about that property. There's probably about 40 of these up right now, and they're still expanding and installing them, too. Here's a reflection park. This used to be up on the mall by the convention center, kind of tucked away and hidden, got moved. Jocelyn Worsberger, who'll be here in a couple of weeks, helped get this done in 1977 along with Mallory Knights, uh, a black fraternal organization. I've been to the mountaintop. I mean, the skateboarders love this thing, and you can see why. And now it seems to be, it was getting creamed up there, but now it's down here with, and, and a little bit more attention given to it, and the skateboarders kind of eased off. I mean, this, these, these two parks are great skateboard parks, but it seems like, there's a little unwritten law. Let's don't damage these parks with skateboarders. We'll find other places to get in downtown Memphis. A uh, lot of signs in here, symbolism, uh, photos from Dr. Uh, Dr. Withers, a reflection ponds. It's the Reflections Park. John Jackson was the architect here. Last time I was in there giving a tour, he just happened to be sitting there reflecting. So we got to talk to the architect. He liked talking. The Universal Life Building there, Danny Thomas and formerly Linda, but MLK restored by... Uh, the great architects, um, Jimmy, I'll put his name in a minute. Huh? Jimmy Tucker, that's right. Self Tucker Architects. There you go. Thank y'all. Joseph Walker, the great uh, pioneer in insurance and many other things. Uh, he left a uh, uh, medical degree from a Harry Medical College, but got into the insurance business, founded Universal Life in Memphis, uh, founded Tri State Bank, became the fourth largest black owned insurance business in America. That's huge. Uh, um, the daughter, Lucy uh, Walker, Lucy Walker, I forget, <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm blown blank, uh, was a female president of the company, too. That's in our Women of Achievement one. Founded four churches, uh, served as president of the Na National Negro Business League, YMCA, Lamont College, Boy Scouts, just like all the things we was into in the community. There's a historical marker for the building. Here's the one for his house over there on Mississippi Boulevard near Walker. That walker's not named for him. That's named for another walker earlier in the century that owned a grist mill down there. There's the Universal Life Building that's been, uh, uh, it's refurbished as an incubator now for black businesses, a beautiful re restoration job there, and an area that's starting to come back now. You know, in the 1950s and 60s, we had 15 different projects, 572 acres, over 3,000 buildings that were torn down during urban renewal during that time. That whole area you see along Danny Thomas in that south area, and that's being renewed now uh, in a good way. Tristank Bank, uh, founded in 1946, like I said. Uh, this building was torn down recently there at Main and Bill. They still have two other offices and, and other more convenient places in the community. Uh, but they really helped a lot of people get loans for homes. And uh, today there's 43 employees and $156 million in sales at three sites. Now the Olive CME Church is at Linden in Lauderdale. It was formerly First Baptist Church that moved out to Poplar and Parkway after it had gotten yanked away from there on 2nd Street when they built the courthouse. And you'll see here, there's the First Baptist Church side of the marker. Uh, and then uh, there it is, beautiful inside that sanctuary there, the dome up there at the top. Uh, and here are the two markers there. It was erected in 1906 and the second marker, or cornerstones, let's say, for the church on site. Uh, Linden, or King in Lauderdale now. The spirit of Beale Street, B29, uh, B24 bomber. Uh, the spirit of Beale Street in World War II. Captain Luke Weathers, uh, Tuskegee Airmen. Uh, and they had a great parade for him. He shot down seven enemy planes. He got the Purple Heart, Distinguished Flying Cross, a Tuskegee Airman from Memphis. Captain Luke Weathers Day, 1945, a big parade on, on Beale Street, of course. Uh, Shelby County Training Schools. It's out in the Woodstock area when you get out in that area, and there's actually a, a real nice memorial. It's hard to read. A lot of names that were veterans uh, from the uh, area of Shelby County, black veterans, let's say. Zion Cemetery down on South Parkway. A lot of interest in that the last five years of keeping it restored. Um, 20th century timeline. So in the 1930s, we had a second wave of immigration coming up. Memphis, St. Louis, Chicago, Detroit, black seeking economic opportunity in the, in the city, still separate but equal till the 1960s. You had several lawsuits. Uh, uh, Russell Sugarman passed away this week, and uh, Carol Perra was talking about Russell Sugarman today with me on the phone. Uh, here, she met her husband in that office later on. They, you know, they're good friends. I think he might have married him, but I understand that. Well, we'll get on to him in a minute. But all these lawsuits got equal access. In fact, the public swimming pools are actually closed in 64 because the Park Commission didn't want black and white kids swimming together. And in 1961, one of the big court cases was 
um, with, we went to the Supreme Court. We were desegregating our parks too slow on a 10-year plan. And, um, and so the Supreme Court said, you got to do that faster. So they, in 1965, they didn't open the public swimming pools. Uh, or 63, 64, and 65, they did open them, and whites swam Fridays, Saturdays, Sundays, Mondays, Tuesdays, black swam on Wednesdays, and the po pools were closed on Thursdays for the weekly cleaning. Hello? That's a little bit more insulting than anything else, I think. Uh, normal tea room, some of the students got all upset over there during the campus at University of Memphis. Again, there's Beale Street in the 60s. Here's T.O. Fuller State Park, the first state park in the country, I believe, named for an African-American east of the Mississippi River. Uh, T.O. Fuller being a great leader here. A Boy Scout camp up there at Douglas Park. There's a marker I found not too long ago there. Uh, here's the, the second great migration, the map. You see where people were going to, getting into the big cities. The Memphis World uh, newspaper, 1931 to 72, very strategic newspaper here. And they uh, covered local news, full page of comics by black artists, exposed police brutality, dealt with issues of concern to African-American readers. And some of the contributors were Nat Williams and Ernest Withers. Uh, I like that full page of comics by black artists. Uh, the Memphis World, there's some of the editions right there you can find. Of course, the Tri-State Defender, I think it's called the new Tri-State Defender now. Bernard Smith has since passed away. He was a president recently. Karanj is still there. He's a friend of mine. Uh, Tri-State Defender, doing some good stories right now. Um, Lee Smith is on the heritage in, the, in that heritage area. Sputnik Monroe, I got to bring a wrestler in here. The reason why is he, uh, he let his black fans come down on the arena floors. This time when the black fans or the colors had to sit up in the upper balconies, couldn't come down to the front. Uh, and that was made him mad with the white rednecks. You're nothing but a communist. You're a damn Sputnik. And that's, he took that name. He has, you know, the Sputnik the satellite. Sputnik Monroe's real name's Roscoe Brumbaugh. I met him in 2000 at the Rock and Soul Museum. We got his trunks and his boots and his jacket uh, <laughs> there because all the musicians loved him. He was a great uh, wrestling and music has always gone together in Memphis. As much as our music went out to the world, we gave everybody wrestling, WWE and WCW and all that stuff. He got a he would lay down in, in the middle of Main Street just to make the white police mad. He'd get arrested. He would walk up and down Beale Street when whites weren't supposed to. He actually got arrested for being a white man in a black-owned bar after midnight. That was his crime. He wasn't tearing the place up. He was just in the wrong place, according to some white policemen. And, of course, what did he do? When he went to the uh, court, he was represented by Russell Sergerman, a black attorney. This put it in your face like the first time that had happened. In our, and so, don't, so we like Sputnik Monroe. Uh, 230 pounds of twisted steel and sex appeal. <laughs> oh, that's Willie Bearden. I'm sorry. Uh, what did he say? His philosophy on wrestling was win at all costs, lose if you must, cheat if you have to, and if they take you out of the ring, take it out, tearing everything up. That was his philosophy right there. But cheat if you must. Wrestling? They cheat in wrestling? Don't buy gas where you can't. Use the restroom. A bumper sticker there right by this license plate, the only state in the country to have a license plate in the shade of a state, Tennessee. Uh, but that was by the National Council of Negro Leadership. You know, uh, bus station, white waiting room, uh, Hotel Clark, this is right where Blue City Cafe is right there where the band box is. It was the best service for colored only is what it says right there, Hotel Clark. Rex Billiard Hall for colored. Rex Theater for colored people. The Malco Theater, here it is right here, but in 1962, I learned this lesson from Alan Lightman. When, uh, he wrote a book called Screening Room, and he told this story about you had the colored entrance here to Malco Theater right there on the, the Bill Street side right here. Go up to the third balcony. And the way they desegregated that, they said, don't tell the mayor. Let, they told the police chief, don't tell the mayor. We're going to sneak some folks in after the lights go down. And when the lights come back up, people will see black folks on the first level. And they started just doing it more and more and more in 1961 or 62. That's how we desegregated the public theaters in Memphis. M.A. Lightman Company, Malco, M.A. Lightman Company. Yeah, one minute? Oh, a long time ago. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I, you know, see why I do this now? I don't look at you. I just ignore you. <laughs> Memphis State 8, the first eight students to desegregate Memphis State University. Maxine Smith tried the year before, didn't get it. She went and joined the, as a student volunteer in NAACP local chapter. These are the eight. Five are women. Here they are. Dedication 100 years later uh, of the historical marker we helped write for them, the Memphis State 8. Right there in September of 2012. Right to by the administration, the Memphis 13, October 3rd, 1961. Nine of the 13. And I know there's only 12 kids in this picture. I do not know why. Y'all counting, aren't you? <laughs> People do that to me. But I don't know why. Why don't y'all find that out for me? What happened to the 12th, 13th kid for the picture? 
Uh, but these are the ones, um, and it probably, uh, other cities were doing it with high school age kids, they were getting in fights. And uh, so Memphis branched into the ACP. Let's do it with first graders. The first graders are kind of docile and not spoiled. They interviewed 200 first graders, and they probably said, we traumatized 13 first graders for the rest of their life. And when we met with 9 to the 13 during the dedication day, they did kind of express that feeling as well. We uh, had a great dedication. Here they are, pint-sized pioneers is what we said on the marker. I thought that was a great statement. Um, and we went to Bruce Elementary School to start out with, had the mayors and Brett Cohen and uh, school board president with all these uh, proclamations and apologies and everything. It was really tense. It was a tearful moment, tough, tense moment at Bruce. Dr. Gray had arranged for a Corvette club to give a, a Corvette for every one of the cars, a Corvette tour around town with a police escort. We broke every law in Memphis that day, going from Bruce to Rosell to Gordon to Springdale Elementary School, just like it was a funeral. Boom. And uh, got around to Withers Collection at the end of it. And, and by the day, the third school, it was like homecoming. Everybody was having a joyful time. They shared a lot of baggage in an hour driving around town, hearing testimony at each one of these schools. Because what the marker says, you got Memphis 13 on one side. This is the same on four of the markers. But on each school, we have a different one just for that school. And all the students that went to that school are mentioned here, and their parents, to a person, they wanted their parents mentioned on here. Leading black citizens in the community, as you can see here, of the 13, Bruce, Rosell, Springdale, and Gordon Elementary Schools. It's all different there. And that was, and we got to Withers Collection and had a great time celebrating it all. The Lee sisters, the most arrested family in America, according to Jet Magazine in the 1960s for their nonviolent sit-ins and protests. Along Main Street, we got this and put on Main Street. It is the only historical marker on Main Street between Poplar and the Arcade. That's two miles of street right there. How about that? Piggly Wiggly's on Jefferson, I know. So you got uh, Temple Israel up there at Exchange. You've got modern movie making all the way down at the Arcade. And so it's, why not? This all happened right there, and the Downtown Memphis Commission agreed with us, and so did the property owners in the area. Right across from Old Goldsmiths, right in front of uh, Jolly Royal, or the Shaneberg Black and White, uh, and we dedicated, there's five of the seven sisters. There's Elaine Lee Turner who runs a Heritage Tours of Memphis on the Tennessee. Look at old Sylvester right there. He's gone now. Uh, but the B&W is still in the Terrazzo tile there as you go into the, the Jolly Royal. Uh, Dr. Gray used to work in the basement there in the 1950s as a kid. There's the old black and white store right there. And he was right in the, here's, so the marker's right here. I mean, right there, right now. Uh, there's the goldsmiths across the street. Everybody remembers that goldsmiths. Anthony Chapel School up in Barrettville, historical marker we did with hair. And I, the way I understand it, see how that county line kind of goes whoop like that? Well, there wasn't any vacant land up there in that area for blacks to have a school. Have you been up to that part of that? There's a lot of vacant land. Well, there's a lot of farm land, and I'm sure it's precious land. So they had to apparently buy a little piece of Tipton County to put the school in. But Anthony uh, Barrett uh, is named for Anthony Chapel School there and the uh, Greenwood Amy Church and Cemetery. Uh, this is John Strong, uh, who I used to know at Millington School, and he's a principal, I believe. Bridgewater School out there in Cordova, one of the Rosenwald schools. Um, integrating public parks. This is an interesting story. Went all the way to the Supreme Court, and you'll see right here, Pink Palace get, became a great test case in 1963. The city attorneys argued that they were not opposed to integrating the museum, but they were worried that ending segregation would violate the original property deed here. How about that? Uh, so that kind of got stalled out that way, and they finally did it, let's say. So Pink Palace played a big part. Uh, the desegregation of Pink Palace played a big part with the Supreme Court of the United States. You know, we appeared later on in 71 with Overton Park and the Expressway. So we've, we've had quite a few visits to the Supreme Court from this town here. Um, so a lot of the first parks, of course, Church Park and Lincoln Park, Douglas Park. Uh, Chairman Galloway resigned after the mayor forced uh, Douglas Park uh, on the White Park Commission structure. Brooks Art Gallery in the zoo. Uh, Danny Thomas came to town, saw where Bill Street was named Bill Avenue. He didn't like that. The white politicians just wanted Bill Street. It had such a ring to it. That was the classic name. So they said, we got an ordinance. All the east-west thoroughfares are avenues. All the north-south are streets. So they changed it to Bill Avenue. Danny Thomas wrote a song called Bring Back Bill Street. Played it in uh, uh, his uh, fundraising concerts at Crump Stadium. Had 2,000 records pressed for the jukeboxes. Went before the city commission at the time. And they agreed to turn, change it back to Bill Street. That is not a real gun. This is the cover of the album. That's Mayor Frank Toby painting out Avenue to making it Bill Street. The only east-west street in Memphis is Bill Street. Because of Dan you thought he came here to open up a hospital, didn't you? <laughs> well, he did in 1962 later on. 
And the architect was a black architect by the name of Paul Williams. And of course, this is the first integrated hospital in Memphis because it received patients regardless of race, creed, color, nationality, or ability to pay at that time. 1964, the Mid-South Coliseum was the first public assembly building built in Memphis with desegregation in its design. Same entrances, concession stand seats, and restrooms. First one is Coliseum. It's on the National Register of Historic Places. I like the idea of saving the Coliseum. We need that secondary venue. I'm not a politician. 68 sanitation worker strike, court order busing, probably the worst thing that happened to our country in neighborhoods. Of course, we didn't like it here. We buried buses. I don't think anybody agrees with busing, destroying schools and local neighborhoods. Make those schools right. Make them better. But don't just ruin neighborhoods and make kids ride buses for two hours a day. Cornelia Crenshaw Library down there on Vance. Boy, did she speak her mind. Yes, she did. She spoke her mind. It's right on the side of that building right now. In the newly restored building there. It looks good. And real quickly, the out by Colonial Junior High on Colonial Road and Vern is where the actual accident occurred one block from Colonial, but the, you know, people don't want a public sign like this in their front yard, so it's one block away in a public area there where the school is. See, there's, you don't want that sign right there in that person's yard. Uh, it'd be dangerous for people crossing the street and parking and all that, so it's down, uh, down by the school. Um, oops, Joseph C. Warren, there it is right there. That, that could be what I'm doing wrong. Uh, here by the North Memphis compound on Mar Street is a house that was saved. Uh, some, you know, all the meetings for the sanitation strikes were held in either churches or funeral homes because whites wouldn't go and harass people in those two places, and they would harass them in homes. But this Joseph C. Warren house was used uh, for that. We did a historical marker there, and here's some of the. There's Mr. Nickelberry. Some of the former workers were still there. There's J.T. Young, M.L.G. and W. Saw him yesterday. There's Kenneth Moody. Uh, I got to be at MLG and W, got a, a certificate for helping with the archives yesterday. I took my November the 6th, 1934 street sign and made a big, big, de big deal out of that. So we're going to get that changed sooner or later. Uh, MLG and W likes me. Uh, there's a marker right there. We're very appreciative of MLG and W for that and the Friedman marker they're going to put on the campus downtown. Uh, we enjoyed doing this marker. Uh, the Sanitations Worker Prayer. Every time I do a talk in uh, Claiborne Temple, I always bring this prayer out. And think of this to the tune, if you can say that, of the 23rd Psalm. Our Henry, who art in City Hall, hard-headed be thy name. <laughs> thy kingdom come, C-O-M-E, was the commission, I mean the community on the move for equality. Thy kingdom come, our will be done in Memphis as it is in heaven. Give us this day our dues check off. And forgive us our boycott as we forgive those who spray mace against us. Lead us not into shame and deliver us from loathe. For ours is justice, jobs, and dignity forever and ever. Amen, freedom. And that was uh, Reverend Malcolm Blackburn, who I think was a white minister at the time, delivered that prayer on February 26, 1968 at Claiborne Temple. Those marches got snowed out. They came back March 28th, and the rest is history. Handheld signs, snowed out March 22nd. Uh, Dr. King came as a practice for his Poor People's March. Uh, here's a, a mural there uh, with it at the Wells Fargo across from the Tops on Union. You know, one of my landmarks is Memphis. Just go to the Tops and take a right. You know, you'll get somewhere. There's 15 Tops in Memphis. This is on the mural. All these uh, names are listed on there. Fannie Lou Hamer with the Civil Rights Movements. Uh, just a nice mural there on the Wells Fargo Bank. There's Claiborne Temple, uh, formerly Second Presbyterian Church. There's the posters of famous Dr. Uh, Withers shot. That's Elliot Perry's grandfather doing the photobomb right there. Photobomb before he had photobomb, wasn't it? Uh, and they marched off. And, and what Dr. Withers told me, he said, Jimmy, we knew there's going to be trouble the next day. The white, uh, white rednecks didn't want Dr. King in town stirring things up. And the black radicals didn't think he was moving fast enough with his nonviolent peaceful protest. So what they did is they took those posters that you saw and nailed them to those stakes. And when they had the march the next day, when the trouble broke out, they could pull the posters off and have something to defend themselves with. That's the, picture, the story behind that picture right there. You didn't know that, did you? And Dr. Withers, who took that picture, who helped nail those posters on those stakes, told me that in 2003 at the Memphis Rock and Soul Museum. I said, I'll remember that forever. Uh, just like Dr. Kyle's talk uh, at the room. And there's Russell Catron. The, actually, the, the march broke up. Destruction along there on Beale Street. Tanks on Beale, remember that? Dust the dawn curfew. Uh, arcade had to put locks on its door. Never had locks on its door until after the, that. Looks like Beale Street now, doesn't it? With all the cops down there and parked in the street. April 3rd, the balcony. Well, I guess a real quick story here. I know we're limited for time. Well, they're waiting on Jesse Jackson. This is what Dr. Kyle said. Jesse was always late. 
And uh, so he showed up without a coat and tie there at room 306. And Martin looked at Jesse and said, you're not dressed right to go to Miss King's house tonight, uh, Miss Kyle's house tonight for dinner. He didn't have a coat and tie on. And Jesse looks at Martin and goes, my dress code don't dictate my appetite, my stomach does. <laughs> Martin rolled his eyes. Jesse was always flippant with him. Walked out to the balcony, looked down at Ben Branch, who's the sax uh, saxophone player. Play it for me. Play it real pretty tonight. Oh, precious Lord, take my hand. That's when the shot rang out. And he fell back into Dr. Kyle's arms, laid him down, blood everywhere. Dr. Kyle runs into the room for the operator-assisted telephone. The operator had heard the noise, went out. She had a stroke. She died later on. He was already dead. They went to St. Joseph Hospital, uh, declared DOA there. Went to R.S. Lewis and Sons Funeral Home at 374 Vance. We did a historical marker for them a couple years ago, right behind FedEx Forum there, and prepared for viewing in Memphis for one day before we went to Atlanta. That's the quick sequence. There's that famous picture Mr. Withers didn't take, but he developed it because the young photographer was just too shook up. So he actually developed that film in that little dark, uh, dark room you see there at the Withers Collection now. Of course, to come back, there's the Rainbow Tail sign. Uh, April 7th, Miss King comes back and finishes that march. There's R.S. Lewis and Sons Funeral Home. There's a marker. <laughs> We had a great time that day. Miss Lewis had lived there since the 1940s. It was a July day, and we got through and went inside to get a drink of cold water with ice in it. Jimmy, you want to go upstairs and play some ping pong? <laughs> what? We had all this serious marker. We, we, we get serious on the text, don't we? And uh, I said, no, ma'am, I thought this was a funeral home. Well, back in the 40s and 50s and 60s, they didn't want their kids going over into foot homes and getting in trouble. So they built a little rec room up here on top of the funeral. They put the home in the funeral business. That's why you call it funeral home. And the kids would play up there ping pong and pool. That's where they had some of the meetings for the sanitation strike. And I said, no, ma'am, for two reasons. I'm not going to let you beat me in ping pong. A 93-year-old black woman beat me in ping pong? you kidding me? Linda, how would I do that? You know, and I certainly wasn't going to beat her on a home court in the funeral home, you know. So I said, no, ma'am, I'm a little bit tired today. I'm hot. But anyway, you get to meet the nicest people during these historical markers. There's Miss King finishing the mark. Look at the cameraman up here on the roof and everything and on ladders right there. Uh, finished the mark, made it to City Hall, peacefully, quietly, arriving at City Hall. And you get to the mayor's office. This is later on, two, uh, two weeks later, the strike is settled. Mayor Loeb's there in his office, uh, black and white ministers, everybody's okay. And then Bob Williams, who's still alive at Kirby Pines, the great photographer, took this picture. He got back. It's a loaded shotgun underneath the desk right there. See, in the mayor's office, until they moved the office up to the seventh floor, like Hackett. Well, this is where Loeb had a shotgun right here. You know, okay, great. But let's say it again. Open door policy, loaded shotgun underneath the desk. <laughs> you can draw the A, B, C, D, and E on that, right, and other. Dr. Harrington, Myron Lowry. Uh, Dr. Harrington actually did occupy that same office and area. Lowry and Morton had already moved upstairs, I believe. Harrington moved the offices up by three. Uh, uh, let's see, elected mayor, elected mayor, appointed during the succession. And then, of course, J.O. Patterson was the first, when uh, Chandler resigned in 1982, first appointed uh, black mayor of Memphis. Dr. Wittes, we'll close with him, I think, here. Uh, and this is uh, uh, Held Hat on the Trail, the book by Hampton Sides, I think is very good. But Judge Preston Battles, quote, about Memphis has been wrongfully and irrationally blamed for the murder of Dr. Martin Luther King. Neither the defendant nor the victim lived in Memphis. Their orbits merely intersected here. And that's the judge who presided over the James Earl Ray sentencing. There's some truth to that right there, too. Uh, sometimes we take on a little bit too much that Memphis killed Dr. King. Yes, this was the stage. A lot of things weird happened all during that time in the 60s. You could make a good story for it, conspiracy in that, I think. And go talk to, talk to Judge Joe Brown about that. He's, he was also presided on and saw all the evidence later on. And he's really interesting to talk to. I got to sit on a panel with him last year at the Withers Talk It Out Tuesdays. Withers Gallery, 333 Bill Street. This is a, your staycation. Go to Withers Gallery and you'll thank me. I assure you. And by the way, nobody's ever come up to my front door and knocked on the door and asked me a history question. They've always called me or got me by the internet. And that's the same speed in Knoxville as it is in Memphis, right? Okay. Do you get that? Did I kind of drift off? Okay. 333 Bill, right across from New Daisy. Uh, they've expanded the place. A lot of posters on display, stories. We just received the other day. I was there. I got to unpack a box of of a mount of uh, Rosa Parks on a bench that's just wonderful to have on display there. No white people allowed in zoo today. You know, he took all these great pictures. He was all over. But he was on that bus five hours before King got arrested on that bus in Montgomery. He wouldn't arrest Dr. Dr. Withers for being a black man on the bus. Uh, they wanted King. Uh, his house on mm, Brooks Road down there just got a, a historical marker last year. Ernest and Dorsey C. Withers uh, Foundation did that. The Boulevard, uh, this is inside there. Uh, there's the great book I love. 
Uh, and he, he liked me so much he gave me this picture of Jackie Robinson because he knew I liked baseball. And here he is in a pulpit of Mason Temple in 1960 campaigning for a man running for president. Not Kennedy, but Richard Nixon. Jackie Robinson. Oh, the Republican Party's the one that got this country desegregated now, not the Democrats. Things have shifted, but Goldwater was too far right for him. He didn't vote for Goldwater in 64, he said, but he voted for Nixon again in 68. Uh, no white people allowed in zoo today. Just an incredible picture right there in our separate but equal folks. Where there's a tombstone at Elwood Cemetery, it's the shape of a camera. It's on the tour. How about that? Uh, other notables, we haven't gotten to enough today because of the sake of time, we've blown time anyway. We're in overtime, I know. Double overtime, triple overtime. Oh, Luke, Luke is so good here. You see all these names we could talk about forever. Aretha Franklin, uh, only Memphian, born in Memphian on the cover of Time magazine was Aretha Franklin. She only lived here two years, though, went to Motown. It was a, a preacher father moved up there. The other two Memphians that were, came to Memphis on the cover of Time magazine were Crump in 47 and Kimmins Wilson in 72 for their achievements. Muted bells over here by the university, uh, right by the University Art Museum. Those are B-E-L-L-E-S and bells with that E. Uh, people who kind of broke the ceiling here for a lot of things, that old institution of being a Southern Bell. Uh, Memphis edu dash A-M-U-M. Uh, Living Legends and New Sardis Baptist Church. The hallways of New Sardis Baptist Church are really the African American Museum of Memphis, I think. Uh, when you come out for that service this Sunday at 10 o'clock, you'll be amazed and a, and a lot of good lunch. Uh, and I love this picture. This is my guy. Uh, they're actually going to have a statue to Larry Finch sometime soon on campus. Well deserved. But I, when he was a man, a young man in 1969, who when Memphis State had actively not recruited top black athletes in Memphis. We're not recruiting you. We're not recruiting you. Uh, Herb Hood and Tweedy Jackson slipped in there, got on a basketball team. Finch stood up against his own community and said, I'm going to Memphis State. I'm in Orange Mound. I'm going to Memphis State. I want to play in the Coliseum. Uh, and he did in 69. His announcement was on the third page of the May 27th, 1969 newspaper. I went and researched this. I thought it would be him and Ronnie signing together and all that, Ronnie Robinson, because I was big in basketball during that time. But no. And then, of course, in 1973, uh, the 1972-73 media guide is dedicated to Ronnie and, and uh, Larry's mothers in the Memphis State basketball program. But he was out in the community like that. Look at those pants. You know, if that guy for Duke would have been wearing Adidas yesterday, he might not have blown out his shoe, right? You see that shoe get blown? Talk to Willie Gregory about that. But uh, all about the community. Uh, gosh, in 73, the most uniting moment I think our city has ever had was that race to the Final Four championship of our city coming together. And we haven't been close since, is all I'm going to say. And, and Larry came back and was player, uh, assistant coach, coach. I got to work with him a lot in the community centers and playgrounds in the 80s when he was assistant coach. Even when he wasn't coach anymore, he'd tell Dexter Reed, there's the best point guard in Memphis in 1970. He'd point at me, and Dexter wouldn't believe him at all. <laughs> when George Klein the other, died the other day, Dexter called me up about what Larry and George Klein used to say about me being a point guard. Because Dexter had no right hand at all. He was all left hand, if you remember. We, we do a lot of smack talking on that. But Dexter and, and Ryan, and of course Keith Lee and all the great... University of Memphis program, Penny Hardaway in the 1980s. I'm keeping the clock at the Coliseum. Elliot Perry's a senior. Penny's a ninth grader. This big around. He's going to be the best ever. I've never seen him before in our life. And they were on the same team, he and Elliot, that year. Garmer Curry was a coach. And look what Penny Hardaway's done. I mean, I've spoken five years ago at places with him. I called the university up the next day. I said, I'm impressed with this guy. He's got a message. You know, just like he's dressed cleanly. He talks great. He's, he's humorous. He's on point. He's a, you know, I'm, I, some of our university athletes don't make it, you know, unsadly, you know, and I don't want to mention names, but he, uh, Penny has and does, and let's get behind him. Larry did, and Larry is just a, a pillar of this community, and I just love that picture of Larry with all those kids, those beautiful pants. <laughs> Great guy. Uh, thank our sponsors for coming today, Vincent Astor, Phyllis Peterson. <laughs> Erickson Group, University of Memphis Libraries. And uh, it's only 12.45. Y'all stick around for question and answers. Uh,